Dakshay is an initiative of the Documentary Filmmakers Association of South Africa to create opportunities for experienced film professionals to share their knowledge and engage with the work of existing and prospective members. The program also offers a support network for 10 tier three filmmakers who want to apply for their first NFEF development funding. Mentorship is public and we appreciate your attendance. Please note the Dark Share program is powered by the Presidential Employment Stimulus Program, PESP3. And we thank the NFEF for this opportunity. Today, we welcome Enza Samuel, who will be speaking about applying to the NFEF and other funders. Uh, the talk will be followed by an official 15 minute Q&A, 15 to 20 minute Q&A, starting at 16.40. So please start thinking of your questions. However, we welcome questions along the way, if you have any, just to make the session a little bit more interactive. And a little bit about the topic, this practical session looks at best practice when applying for funding, how to develop a schedule of applications and what to keep in mind when acting. Enver will also look at issues around chain of title and what legal paperwork needs to be put in place. And Enver will also use his latest documentary, Murder in Paris, as a case study. Enver, thank you so much for joining us today. Please, could you briefly introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your professional background, and then please dive into the topic. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, thanks for having me and uh, thank you everyone to um, uh, taking the time to, to listen to this talk. Um, so, so I've been in the industry for quite a, lot, quite a while. Um, I started off uh, around about 1990, 1994, I think it was, um, more, more in um, sort of pure sort of sort of commercial driven television work as opposed to documentary. Um, and I did that for a number of years till around about 2012 when I um, when I, I, I decided to change my, my path a little bit and start focusing more on documentary because I, I started to feel that that would become a little bit more fulfilling in my life as opposed to the um, Sort of commercial work that I was doing, and and since uh, 2012, I've kind of more or less concentrated concentrated on making documentaries, um, which have a strong social impact, and and for me, um, it's it's like I've found my true calling now that, that now that I tell these type of documentaries, so kind of a late bloomer in the documentary arena, but. Um, enjoying the, the trials and tribulations of trying to, to uh, make documentaries in, in this environment. Um, so I, I kicked off my first documentary. When I say first, obviously I'd done some before for different, for come some production companies, but the first venture by myself was a documentary called Indians Can't Fly, a document which was about an activist called Amatimo. Um, I followed that up with um, someone to blame the Amatimo inquest, and that, and that was based on uh, the, the inquest, the first inquest of its kind that they had in South Africa, looking into the suicide of Amatimo, um, which was proven to be um, murder and not suicide. And then in 2021, I made the documentary, documentary called Murder in Paris. The documentary has been screened um, on SABC3 and is currently on Showmax. And, um, you know, you, you can watch the trailer on murderinparis.com. Um, I, I, I wanted to use Murder in Paris as an example of how one can raise uh, the appropriate funding um, to tell your documentary. You know, um, you don't have to get tons and tons of money, but you can also do it in, this, in the way that I did it. And, and um, I'll, I'll basically go through my trials and tribulations of trying to make this documentary as a case study in how one can be successful in getting funding. Um, when the documentary was screened uh, on Human Rights Day in 2021, um, it was screened to critical acclaim. 
and um, had the highest ratings, uh, highest ARs for documentary in, in more than a decade on SABC uh, three. Um, it won uh, 13 awards um, locally and abroad, including the best documentary at the Durban International Film Festival, which it um, which it co-shared with uh, I'm Here. Um, and currently it's screened at over more than 50 festivals. Um, what's more important than all that is the legacy that it's left behind um, and continues to do so. Um, I'm big on impact campaigns and, um, you know, the Dalsy September documentary has had an impact campaign that's living beyond um, the broadcast and, and now we're talking about three years later and it's still having an impact. Um, and, and fundamentally that was the unerasure of Darcy September's name, the main protagonist in the documentary. Um, so where did it all begin? Um, that's, the, that's the big, sto the big story. Um, we all have ambitions to tell stories, but sometimes you, you bump into them. Um, I was on a DFA delegation that was attending the um, Visions de Real documentary festival in Switzerland. And I bumped into a relative Darcy September that was at the festival. And we got talking and he, he um, mentioned to me like, why don't you do a documentary on, on, on Darcy September and, um, you know, and that's how it basically began, you know, it kind of fell into my lap. It was a, it was a complete chance meeting. And um, he said, once I get back to South Africa, contact the family spokesperson whose name was um, Michael Aronser, the nephew of Darcy and, and take it from there, um, which, I, which, I, which I did. Um, you know, and as the more I researched the story, the more I, I, I was convinced that I had to tell the story. Um, at this stage is one of the, the crucial stages that um, a docu documentary filmmaker can can get involved in is is the um, is the discussion or discussions you have with the family members to get the permission to tell the story you you want to you want to tell and. Essentially, I um, I was lucky that that um, the, the the person I met in Switzerland had opened the door for me. So so getting that letter of consent was not that difficult because because that door had been opened for me. But nevertheless, when one comes to dealing with letters of consent and permission from family members, it's a delicate um, act and should be treated, um, or, you know, quite warily, that it's not one of the first things that you should put on the table. And it's, and it's, it's one of the things that um, once you feel that you've established that rapport with the family and, and you have, have uh, good relations, then, then you know, it's, it's sort of the right time to start talking about um, permission letters and letters of consent. As some of you will know, when you go to funders, that's one of the first things that they will ask for is, do you have the family's permission to tell the story? So it's an important thing to get, but um, it should not be treated as the be all and end all in the beginning of your discussions with family members. Um, make, it a, make it a gradual process and win their trust. Um, so now you have, you have a wonderful story to tell. You have the family's buy-in. How do you fund the damn thing? Um, that's the big question. Besides um, trying to get a home loan, um, uh, extension on your home loan. Um, you know, our choices are, in South Africa, our choices are the national broadcaster, um, some of the VOD, um, as channels like uh, Mnet, Showmax, and um, Netflix, uh, and then you have funding agencies like the NAVF, GFC, National Film and Video Foundation, Kauteng Film Commission, KZN Film Commission, 
the DTI and IDC, to a certain extent, they don't really seem to feel that documentaries are sexy enough, but um, that's another issue we'll get into. Um, and then there's overseas agencies like, like your Hot Dogs, Blue Eyes Fund, and ITFO, et cetera. Um, so I, I made the decision that, that this story, what, I wanted to tell the story, but I also wanted it to be on, on, on the national broadcaster because that would ensure that many more South Africans would get to see it. But with my previous two documentaries, I entered into pre-licensed deals with the SABC because I wanted to retain the copyright. And for me, that's very, very important. The SABC can commission you, but they will, they will then own the copyright and, it, and your baby doesn't become yours anymore. So I engaged with the SABC on a pre-licensed deal to fund or kickstart the funding process for the documentary. Um, but th this, uh, it leaves you with a catch-22 situation because do I get all the funding and then, um, and, then, and then not have the copyright or do you do it the struggle way and get the initial funding from SABC on a pre-license? And generally, um, this pre-license deal is, is very similar to a commission in terms of the application process, you go through the same process with the SABC. Um, and in my experience, they've committed around about 35 to 40% of the budget. Um, and this, once you get it, is a, is a strong incentive to other funders because they see, first of all, you have the national broadcaster on board, so this is not just a pipe dream, this will have an audience, guaranteed audience. And then you have the seed funding. Um, so your, your building blocks of funding can start. Um, the department that, that one works with at the SABC that does the pre-license deals is called um, industry development. And the contract uh, process is is not a is not a short one. Um, it's it's uh, quite prolonged. I mean, I think if I remember correctly, my contract process took almost a year. So before before there was any money, um, and and it took uh, a few months to get a their letter. Um, of intent that that um, other funders always like, you know, that they, they, the letter that shows that there's already committed funding uh, in, in your project. Um, and then with, with, with that contract deal, with the pre-license deal, you um, generally tie to a three to five year period with, with the SABC where they broadcast it about once um, a year. And then you can, you can stipulate the territories that you, you want um, you to focus on. Uh, I, I generally ask for, um, for Africa, beyond South Africa and, and Swaziland and, and Namibia and, and the world basically for world rights. Um, and and the, the negotiations are always fairly uh, fair and um, you generally get what you what you requ you require um, so so in this in this one year period uh, that it took to get um, the funding I had the big dilemma of how do I how do I start with the story so at some point in your endeavors to make a documentary there there can be what I call, um sacrifice and and there was a point in 2018 in march where it was the 30th anniversary of darcy september's assassination and i i found out that there was going to be a one-week celebration of a life in paris a lot of her colleagues ex-colleagues 
uh, and important people were coming to the celebration. And um, at the time, I, I was involved in a five-month contract. I was I was I was a few weeks into that contract um, on a on a reality series, and I actually went to the producers and told them that I was I was, I was abandoning them, and they and we agreed to tear up my contract because they could see how how um, how sure I was that I wanted to go to Paris, and I took the money out of my home loan and I did that. I financed the crew cameraman and salmon and myself to go to Paris for over a week and shoot and and I never regret that day because that's where the foundation of the whole documentary was was done um, in terms of interviews and meeting the right people um, so so at some point you 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 have to make a little bit of a sacrifice if you're convinced that you want to tell the story that much um so so that happened and then you know uh, i was still waiting for the sabc payment um but still still carrying on and um in my research i discovered that dalcy september worked for an organization in england called um, the international defense and aid fund and i approached them um, they'd metamorphosized into into a different uh, Salt Plaiky Educational Trust, because um, obviously that the the work they're doing during apartheid had changed now. So so they they said they would look into into providing some funding, and um, so so that's another area to look at is the synergy that your project has with uh, potential funders and. Well, their synergy was that Dalsi worked for them and and in the past, and um, they felt that they would like to contribute. And there's this funny story, amusing story I must tell, is that um, one of the, the one of the directors of the organization lives in Cape Town. His name is Horst Kleinschmidt, and uh, so he was Dalsi's boss essentially. And um, we interviewed him, in the, and he's in the documentary. Um, and uh, the cameraman and I, uh, Tim Chevalier, were interviewing him, and he and he just, uh, I think, just before we started the interview, dropped in the word. He said, he said, um, I asked him, um, did you get the funding application? And he said, he just casually dropped in, yes. And he said, um, you've got two fifty, and. So I look at, looked at Tim and Tim looked at me and then, but we had to start the interview. And so like in my head, while the interview was going on, I'm th I was thinking, so it can't be 250 um, Rand, definitely. Um, so is it 250 pounds? Because, because the organization originates in, in the UK. And the same, probably 250 pounds. And um, then uh, the interview finished and we're having lunch. And then I said, so is it 250 pounds? And he said, he, and, he, and he laughed and he said, no, it's 250,000 Rand. <laughs> and that, that was the, the first actual funding before the, 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 the funding came through from the SABC. And, and that's kind of the funding that kind of you got, oh, wow, some relief, you know. Um, you know, now I'm not just working uh, on, on air, but um, there's actually some money to pay people. Um, but yes, so, so that's just a, a little story about how, um, uh, you know, your funding can come from different sources. Um, uh, the second, the, se the second opportunity came, uh, as I said, from from the SABC, um, and 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 then I followed up with um, with funding to the National Film and Video Foundation in their production uh, slate, um, and um, I think that was about that time. It was a three hundred fifty thousand rand uh, maximum. Um, and was successful. Um, then I, I approached the Gauteng Film Commission and I was, I was successful for that. I think that was about 100,000 Rand. 
um, also a long process to get from, from, from application to, to approval. Um, but I saw that the, the funding was becoming easier and easier. Um, then I was faced with the dilemma, um, and you see it in the documentary that I ended up uh, researching and finding out about a lot of archive. And um, a lot of that archive originated in France. Um, and, you know, the, our, my quotes were being were something like 19 euros a second. And I, 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 was, I, I think I, I used more than close to 15 minutes. So, so that bill was piling up and up higher and higher. Um, uh, but I, I, I negotiated with them. They, they liked the story and, and they and thought that uh, Darcy's September story should be told. And the 19 euros came down, I think it was to 14 euros in the end, but it was still a lot of money. And um, I then approached the Nelson Mandela Foundation. So, so beyond the, the, the usual suspects, like the NAVF and GFC, and DTI, et cetera, one can look at um, NGOs um, and organizations like the Nelson Mandela Foundation, who's, who's, um, who had a synergy to, to the story of Darcy September in their advocacy work. So, so they agreed to pay for all of the archive, um, you know, and, and that, was, that was another sort of uh, tick of the, of the funding box. Um, you know, uh, so one 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 doesn't have to look at the, the usual suspects. One one can um, attempt to get funding from various different sources beyond those. Um, so to recap, um, the the major funder for the project was the SABC pre license deal, and I, I'm 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 not. Um, you know, like embargo to tell you uh, that that was 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 about that was about five hundred thousand rand. Um, the International Defence and Aid Fund contributed two hundred fifty thousand rand. National Film and Video Foundation three hundred fifty thousand rand. Gauteng Film Commission one hundred thousand rand. Nelson Mandela Foundation one hundred thousand rand. Um, so that gives you, I think it was. So I managed to raise in total, I think about 1.3 million um, to tell, to, to enable me to tell the, the, doc, the story. Um, I mean, that's, that's kind of, uh, you know, I don't know, some of my colleagues deal with much, much bigger, bigger budgets than that, but that was sufficient for me to tell the story um, in, in a, in what I think was was a was a, was a fairly uh, well thought out sort of strategy to to, to get your story across. Um, in addition to working with 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 funders like, for example, the Nelson Mandela Foundation, I also con, con, uh, uh, was in discussions with the Legal Resource Center, etc. And and all of these organizations provided me with letters of um, support. So those letters of support help a lot when you're putting your application process together to organizations like the NFVF and um, uh, the, the GFC. Um, so in addition to the production funding that I got, which I just mentioned, after the documentary was complete and, and had a very successful run, um, I, I uh, applied for funding for the impact campaign for the documentary. And this is very important for certain type of documentaries. If, if it's not just about the broadcast um, and a few festivals, but what impact does the documentary have? Um, and uh, was successful there again uh, with, um, with raising funds for the documentaries impact campaign with the, with the PIPs um, via NAVF, Presidential Employment Stimulus Package which enabled us to run a comprehensive impact campaign for six months. And then after that, um, I approached Doc, Doc A, Doc Africa, which uh, enabled us to carry on with the impact campaign. 
and do big things, um, screenings in France and, and, and um, uh, actual life-size mural of Darcy September. So there are um, other avenues of getting funding um, beyond actually having completed the documentary. Um, the, 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 you find that the, the funding agencies have call outs um, and deadlines, et cetera, which are, which are quite prominent online. Like I'm, I'm, I'm not really gonna sort of like give you those addresses and details because it's simple enough to find and, 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 and Google the NAVF, um, you know, and GFC and, and see what they, what, they, um, what they have to offer. Um, just with regards to the pre-license, um, as it's the same as the commission and um, basically uh, you, you, you apply through the SABC three, um, SABC portal, um, which, which has all the information. Uh, I think I can, how long have I been talking? 30 minutes. So um, just a quick one to wrap up then, uh, you know, from, from tips from the funding agencies, tips that they're looking for and i'm sure in the previous discussions they've talked about this um at length uh particularly i think tiny's talk um but i'll just sort of recap from my experience because because i have had multiple fundings from agencies like navf um you know uh some of the questions they like to be answered are what is your connection to the story? Write the story like you're doing a drama, not just facts and figures from the internet. Know what is your controlling idea, inciting incident and dramatic question. Have a clear narrative structure. Have clear character development and a story arc. And I think most of all, believe in your story. Um, Taryn, uh, I think I've talked myself, my mouth dry. <laughs> no problem. Um, thank you, Enver. Motla Lepule, thank you for your attendance at various webinars that we've hosted. I'd like to invite you to please ask your question out loud. Uh, otherwise, I will read it out if you prefer that. Hi everyone. Uh, I, I just want, I wanted to ask uh, the guy, uh, what do you what do you actually say to uh, to the potential funders, especially if they are your uh, your NGOs and stuff like that? Because those people most of the time they clueless about the film and then kind of like speaking some Greek to them whenever you're speaking like finding the film and all that, even though they do the, S the CSIs and all that, but they, they hardly uh, think of film as one of the CSIs and all that. What do you actually say? What, what's the actual uh, proper way of approaching those people? And the last one is, uh, at what stage do you approach the funders when you're still uh, making your film, like on development, pre-production, when you have your, uh, your trailer and all that? And, how simple is it for you to actually have a trailer before you have actually the full footage of the film? Can you actually source the funds for the for actual only trailer or what? Thank you. Um, well, I think the question about the fund uh, the funders from NGOs being clueless is is um, is is your main problem because because you you need to identify an NGO that is that 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 is has a similar um, significance to the story you're trying to tell so that immediately the NGO identifies with your story um, because it, there's there's um, there's a synergy so um, you know, if if I'm doing a story on 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 AIDS, then I, I apply to to AIDS NGOs. So so they're not going to be clueless. They 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 they'll know exactly and and see that oh that this is a this is something we want to get involved in 
because it has potential to tell the story. And, and so, so identify your NGO, um, you know, uh, that, 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 that they will, will see some, some potential from your project. Um, with regards to at what stage do you, do you um, uh, apply for funding? I mean, with NAVF, you can do that in, in, in development, production, uh, post-production, archive. There's, there's various stages that you can apply for the funding. So, I mean, obviously, I think you try, try to do it at the beginning, which is, which is uh, development. Um, trailers, trailers, trailers can, can be made before you commence with production. Um, you know, but that's up to you how, how you decide to do it and, and how much finances you have to make a trailer. Thank you, Enver. Uh, thank you, Motlale Pule. We have a question from Kanye. How much revenue have you generated from the project? Also kindly explain on financial recouping plan or strategies. Thank you. So, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, and it's also a difficult question to answer at the same time because um, you know, I haven't been doing any bean counting, but essentially I don't think so um, you know, that the documentary made it made more than it was actually made for in terms of its revenue. Um, I, I, I don't know how the SABC um, come to their uh, sort of recruitment, recruitment plan for the, for the documentary. Because they show it for 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 five screenings, and and um, you know that's that's out of my purview, um, but it I managed to get it onto Showmax, and that that was um, a payment of a hundred thousand rand. So so when the documentary was made, you know there was no plan. Or, 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 or plot to say, I made it for 1.3 million, so we must make 2.3 million in revenue and sales. That's, that's not been the case. Um, the main thing is about getting the documentary out there and, and um, letting people discover who Darcy September was. That's the main priority. Thank you. And can Clifford and then Lauren please go ahead and ask your questions out loud? Thank you. Thank you so much, um, uh, Samuel. I think this is one of the the best uh, uh, presentations we've uh, um, come across in these uh, uh, sessions, and we thank the DFA for giving us this opportunity. Your story is really captivating. I wanted to find out how long did it take? Did the budget move? For example, uh, your initial plan, or how it developed in terms of adjust adjustment. You are lucky. I can say you managed to get uh, uh, funding, but um, did did it uh, did it spread with the the, the, the availability availability of funds? And uh, and and um, lastly. When you take them to this, um, uh, you say it has gone through, it has, it has been premiered in many, um, uh, yeah, in many, in many uh, festivals. Yes. What happens when they premiere in these festivals? And um, does it have implications in terms of the budget in terms of and budget what i mean is you know what you spend and what you of course your purpose was not to 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 gain as you've explained it quite clearly but then i i think you get what i mean by what is the implication budget wise in terms of when they premiere here what is the implication in terms of the filmmaker mm -hmm. thank you thank you um clifford um so um, basically, uh, with regards to um, our work backwards, the film festivals, um, 
you you apply to festivals and and you and you either get accepted or you don't. Um, some festivals come with screening fees and some don't. Um, when I do screenings that are out of the festival arc, like at universities and institutions, they either offer a screening fee or they don't. And and if they don't, it's fine. If they offer a screening fee, it's great because then that helps me run the 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 website for for um, Mud in Paris. Um, with regards to um, how long it took from that period uh, when I went to do the first shoot in Paris in, in March 2018 and it was broadcast in March 2021 but that was not a process of me working on the documentary for four years consecutively I'm what I call um, a struggle filmmaker in terms of I struggle to make my documentaries but I get them made so it was a stop-start process of me having to work a little bit on the documentary and then go do my commercial work and, and earn a living and then and then come back work on the documentary and then go back to um, commercial work so so it was a stop-start process and I piggybanked on a lot of shoots like I would be in Cape Town for a shoot for for a, for a separate per, um, channel or company, and then I'd stay for two days extra, and then I'll shoot for my documentary. So it's it's tactics like that um, that that one should use uh, to to um, get you know further longevity out of your budget when your budget is not. Um, you know, it's not a killer budget, it's a struggle budget. So, so um, yeah, there's ways and means to do it. And, and I did the stop start process, which worked out perfectly for me. And it was a good thing to not just be working on the documentary for nonstop, because it allowed me to have breathing room, sit back, reflect, you know, those are all important things to do when you're working on a documentary not to just approach it like you're working on, on a sitcom drama type of thing, you know, like a machine. Um, so, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Clifford. Thank you, Enver. Lauren, Clifford Holmes, could you please go ahead? All the Cliffords. Hi, Enver. Nice to be in touch. And um, yeah, super relevant topic. I know there's lots of filmmakers who want to, want to get information on how to get funding. And I, I have a few questions, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna grab probably the top one or two, and you can speak to whatever whatever you want to at this point. But um, I'm working on development of a couple of things right now, and my my first question is: Do you think it's off putting to South African government funders like NFEF, Pest Fund, uh, Eastern Cape, um, you know, film commissions, and so forth, if you're pitching a really high documentary budget? Firstly, so if there are 500,000 to a million rand, you know, opportunity and you're looking at a concept that's, let's say a 20 million rand concept, is that going to be off-putting to them because they're a much smaller percentage of your overall budget um, is, is the one question. And the second is, um, are there any existing opportunities right now in terms of bonds and cash flow? Because exactly like you say, you you know even if you land a pre-licensing deal, which is um, very exciting for bringing on other funders and getting buy into your concept, you don't have the cash flow to as an independent filmmaker unless you're one of the big hitters to get going. Um, and I think there used to be bonders like Hollard and stuff that would come on board and fund and cash flow, but that's kind of dried up from what I understand. I just wanted to ask about that. Um, and the, uh, let's leave the rebit question out the way for now, but the, the last one was, um, how much do you like the idea of pursuing international co-pros as, as a successful route to go when you're trying to get a bigger budget concept made in, in South Africa independently? Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Lauren. Um... So yes, yes, no, definitely um, uh, like a big budget, uh, 20 million plus will, will raise eyebrows. 
Um, but, you know, if, if you have the, um, because obviously a funding agency would, would, would sort of say, okay, so we give our 350,000 Rand or, our, or now NFF is, is boosted up production funding to, to 750,000 Rand. Um, you know, how much at risk is it if, if the budget is so, so big, you know, that, that this would get made. So you have to balance the two and, and, and have um, your ducks in a row quite clearly that, um, you know, the, 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 the other funding sources are very likely and tangible and, you know, to happen. So, so it's not like we're throwing our little um, funding block in, but then, you know, it might all fall apart because, because the, um, the 19 million, 250,000 Rand hasn't been secured, for example. Yeah, um, so if you present yeah. the a finance plan that had these other guys in it, would you rather go and seek your international funding and then pursue your local funding? Um, because they know that you've got a finance plan that's just not impossible um, yeah. rather than going to them first, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or um, you know, you, you go to them and then you, you, um, you basically... You scale down everything, and 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 that this is like the pilot or the teaser or whatever that type of thing. Cool, thank you. Yeah, um, with regards to bonds and cash flow, um, so so I've always tried to, I've try I want to try so desperately to to make a documentary comfortably, um, you know. So so. <laughs> So, so, so um, I've, I've explored the avenue of DTI and IDC, but, but I, after going through that 100 page document, I just, I, I need a good glass of red wine and, and uh, aspirin, um, you know, so, so, so I've never been successful. Um, so I, I really don't have much advice on that, because it never seems to be that, that they take documents seriously. Um, and, and uh, you know, so, yeah. Uh, they, but there are experts um, in that avenue um, that, that you can contact through DFA who, who, are, who are DTI, um, you know, uh, experts on, on raising funds from DTI. So I think, I think uh, chat to DFA to get those names. Yeah, um, thank you. Yeah. I just had a chat to Lisa. Well, she's she's, she's um, definitely very well versed in that. But yeah, I just yes. wanted to join as well thanks so much yeah. thank and and then your international co-productions yes i mean you know like um i mean uh i, I can't speak on behalf of any of you but i but i think that once they see international co-productions with um with uh you know the the, the countries or territories that they already have uh, that working relationship with in terms of treaties like canada and holland that obviously they'll get very excited because, because that means that the, the international co-production partner is bringing in, in, in funding too. So those are things that they look at with, um, with excitement. Great, thanks Envo, appreciate it. I uh, know there's lots of other questions, thanks. Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, Morgan Morris, if you'd like to go ahead and ask your question out loud, please, I see your hand is up and you've put a question in the chat. Thank you. Hi, and like I said, I was gonna ask this question. First of all, thanks a lot for your presentation. I kind of, I think I learned a lot just from the way you explore sort of non-traditional avenues for funding. And I think that's something that I can, would want to do as well. The question is, I have a sort of a, just like you, a sort of a delicious project has fallen into my lap, and but it's a non-South African, but African story. Are there, the question is simply, are there opportunities in South Africa specifically to get development funding for such a project, or am I going to have to cozy up to some, to the Belgians and buy lots of waffles or, or and find a sort of co-producer else in Europe or elsewhere? Uh, or do I just you know, sign away my kids and my organs? Thanks. <laughs> um, so 
Yeah, it's that's a dilemma. Um, but uh, I mean, it, you know, because I don't know your story, um, it's a bit hard for me to say. But but um, you know, I I wouldn't see why NABF wouldn't fund um, a story out of the borders. So. Um, as long as, as as the originator is South African in terms of your applying for the funding, and there's an African or South African connection to the story. Um, so yeah, because I don't know the story, I'm, I'm, I'm finding it difficult to actually make a, make a, make a comment on that. But, but again, um, check out those NGOs uh, in, in Belgium. Um, you know, that, that might uh, be attuned to the story. Thanks, appreciate that. I, I'll, I'll find a way to get the, an outline of the story to you and then perhaps, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. Eric, let's go to your question. You've written, with the different funders on the project, did you have a set production timeline? NFF and Gauteng Film Commission are usually strict with their timelines. How did the funding impact your production? Yes, that's very true. I think um, the NAVF and GFC, if I recall correctly, the, the, the contract um, was for a period of two years. Um, you know, but, but you are, if you give them advance notice, able to extend it and uh, with obviously with, with valid reasons. So I was lucky enough that the periods that I got the funding um, never expired, so so I I, I met those um, those sort of deadlines. They were they were, they were never an issue. But um, if if you're finding that you're going to go over your two years, the best thing to do is just speak to the person that you've been dealing with, um, and and write up something in advance so that they can make an extension. Thank you, Eric. And uh, Nkosi Namandla has asked, how did you get funded by SABC and Showmax? What are they looking for? So, so I, I mean, the SABC was the, was the pre-license model, which, which is basically, I took the story and the concept to them. So, so um, it was accepted and, and, I had to go and pitch the story to them. That was accepted, and then a contract followed. But but on a pre-license arrangement, um, as I mentioned, the 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 copyright retains with me, which was very important for me. So so. And and in the pre-license contract, there's no um, stipulation on video on demand. So so. Once it was broadcast um, and Showmax approached me, I was still able to get that onto Showmax because that was not in the contract, um, you know, the video on demand. Um, so yeah, and that's so that's how Showmax materialized. Thank you so much, Enver. From Aries Knight, we have with regards to archive footage, do you have previews in order for you to make a determination in terms of what you want to make use of and pay for? So what was very interesting with the archive was that obviously the first person people I approach um, would be the national broadcaster, SABC. And um, you know they have an archive department, but they're not digital, so it's an absolute nightmare to find footage there, and and um, their process is is uh, very sort of antiquated. And once I started researching the story and found out that there was this wealth of archive in Paris um, through their institute called the Institute of National Archive, INA with a full-on digitized system, I was literally able to give them dates and, um, you know, of events where Darcy spoke, where she was interviewed on the news, where she was doing speeches, etc. 
and they were able to send me like lists of Dulcie September where you can look at it online then um, then then uh, they send they send it to you uh, digitally and you choose what you want to use they, they have the time codes in and out they, they send you the low res which you use in your edit and um, when you when you when you picture locked then you you make your final calculations of what you're using in the archive and and then you 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 you, you send them those time codes of each and every one that you've chosen I think I chose like there were like over 50 different um, um, sources and but it's a system that works perfectly the you know in terms of the calculation of how much you've used the payment everything work so it's just weird like I live 25 kilometers from the SABC and it was difficult to get the archive and 15 or whatever 14,000 kilometers Paris is away from us in the click of a button, I was able to get archive on Darcy September. Thank you so much. Do we have any final questions? Pamela, I see you've just raised your hand. Please go ahead. Hi, Enver. Thank you so much for today's um, session. Uh, I just want to piggyback off of Eric's questions about um, how the funders might have an impact on the production. I just wanted to know, did, did any of the funders try to um, influence the direction you went in terms of your um, production, like the actual like content? of the production, do they do they try tend to try to do that, like try to have some influence over the actual production itself? Um, yeah, that's it, thank you. So, thank you, Pamela. Um, fortunately not from, from any of uh, like the NGOs and, um, and institutions. So no, no, no influence from the Nelson Mandela Foundation from the Gauteng Film Commission, from NAVF, um, from the, the Institute Dalsi used to work for. Um, only within their right, SABC and in the contract um, have to approve the, the rough cut. And, and um, you know, that was done with minor, minor, minor comments. But I mean, I mean, it's 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 within their right to 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 make uh, comments um, because they are, they have a bigger picture to look at. All right, cool. Thanks. Thank you so much, Pamela. Enva, uh, it's been a privilege hearing from you today. We really appreciate your openness and all your insights. So thank you so much from all of us. And this concludes the 2023 DocShare webinar series. And we thank you all for joining us for the past few weeks, engaging, asking questions uh, and being present. And please note the recordings are available on the DFA uh, link tree on Instagram. And we wish you a great night and see you next time. Thank you so much. And everyone, uh, I wish you luck on making those documentaries you want to tell.